What is autism? The chances are you will have heard of autism, but do you actually know what it looks like and what it's like to live with? When most people think about autism, they think about the toddler mesmerised by the washing machine, the child lining up their toy cars, or the teenager saying something inappropriate without realising. And yes, that is autism. But there's a lot more to it than that. Firstly, just like everyone else, kids with autism grow into adults and then older adults with autism. And just like everybody else, as people with autism get older, we change and adapt. And so we find new ways of coping with the demands of a social, unpredictable, and sometimes rather irrational world. This means we can look very different at six compared to 60, but the autism's still there. Secondly, autism is very heterogeneous. There's an old saying that when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Some people with autism are nonverbal and will require round the clock support all of their lives, while others are gifted pioneers in their field and will be totally independent and self-sufficient. However, most people with autism are somewhere in the middle. Some will need some additional support at home and school, while others will live and work independently, get married and have kids. One thing that all people with autism have in common, both with each other and everybody else, is that a little support and understanding with what we find tricky can make a big difference. Nowhere is that more true than when you're seeing a healthcare professional. But for that to happen, you as healthcare professionals need to be able to identify autism, understand autism, and know how to support people with autism. No matter what field you go into, from anaesthesia to vascular surgery and from paediatrics to geriatrics, you will come across patients with autism. In this short video, we want to introduce you to the basics of autism, what it looks like, what it's like to live with, how to recognise it, and what can happen with the right support. Professor Gilberg is currently the, the foremost clinical researcher in the field of autism. He's just won the MFAR Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and hopefully what we're going to do today is just find out a little bit about how you would assess children with autism. So, welcome Professor Gilberg. I'd really like to start just by asking how you would assess a child with classic autism. Well, it would depend on, on age, uh, because autism presents differently at different ages. And uh, if you're talking about uh, wanting to find children with classic autism at a very young age, say under the age of two, you probably would look out for things like strange reactions to sensory stimuli. Uh, one of the most typical symptoms of classic autism in the first year of life is a very odd reaction, for instance, to certain sounds. Uh, for instance, if you turn on the coffee machine, the child will cover his or her ears and, and uh, you know, you, you can see that that's awful. Uh, the sound is terrible. And am I right, you sometimes get really quite a high-pitched scream with that Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, chaotic screaming uh, and, and really catastrophic reactions. Uh, uh, or it could be the vacuum cleaner, or it could be something like that, or a jingle on, on uh, one of the television programs. Uh, those types of reactions are very typical for very young children with classic autism. You're talking even sort of 18 months, to exactly. years? Exactly. Uh, actually, even even younger. Even younger. So, hi, I'm Tracy. I have a daughter, Ailey, who is now 12. She went through a diagnosis of Asperger syndrome and ADHD at the age of six. She's still kind of struggling with some of the problematic symptoms of both. Um, she has medication for the ADHD, but that does mean that sometimes the kind of Asperger's can really be problematic, as in social settings and stuff like that. Um, I personally attend a few support groups that are helpful. The ADHD Parent Support West Glasgow has been almost like a rock and they really help to give us some strategies and to work together a wee bit better and just to kind of overcome some of the difficulties that can be basically almost like a wall. Whenever Ailey was young she was a fantastic baby um, but as she got older and began walking it was almost like she became quite almost defiant and was always wanting her own way. Um, and then when we were trying to interact at like maybe mother and toddlers and stuff, she really just wasn't socialising well, she wasn't mixing, she wouldn't share. We tried nursery groups and things and it just really wasn't working out. So 
we were beginning to see that there was definitely something that she was not interested in other children um, and was becoming rather upset and really almost distraught um, whenever things were going wrong and she just couldn't really fix things for herself. She wasn't learning those skills. So kind of through nursery, I'd kind of highlighted it and I had varying different things because she was very clever, she was very smart and that almost was problematic because you were getting different views. Some people were saying, oh, she's too clever to have something going on. She's just too smart for nursery. She needs school and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then other people were kind of agreeing that, you know, this is maybe not right. Um, so I think it was probably just my own gut instinct just told me that she was not getting this social thing at all. Although she was very clever and very able, the social side just wasn't really managing and she just was too busy to be able to take the time to learn that skill. Uh, so from 10 months up um, and uh, also at that time you probably would see in the very typical case uh, what we call insistence on sameness, the child wanting always to have everything done in exactly the same fashion every time anything happens that is new they will protest. After that it's more about uh, lack of uh, developing communication. So uh, the child will not, um, you know, respond to his name or uh, not involve. If you try to draw uh, attention to something, usually it will be very difficult to get him to to do what you want uh, to do or to look at what you want him to look at, for instance. And gradually, you also usually then realize he's not speaking, uh, or if he's speaking, it's just the same word over and over again. Uh, and of course all kids start out by uh, talking in echolalic fashions, uh, that's they repeat what you say, but very, very quickly they go on to using those words that they've got for communication. But that usually doesn't happen in classic autism. Instead, this uh, long period of echolalic, just repeating what you're saying. So if you ask, uh, how are you today? They might even at two uh, be responding in the, exactly the same way. Say, how are you today? And so you might even think, oh, he's probably bright because he can you know, use all these words. Uh, but uh, it, it's not for communication. It's just repeating what you're saying. And then there is, of course, around two and a half, a group of kids who still don't speak at all. And that definitely is always a big, uh, you know, question mark. You would really need to assess any child who doesn't speak at all at two and a half. Uh, holistically, you would have to really think hard about what might be the problem here. It could be autism, could be intellectual disability, could be severe language disorder. And very often it's all of those in a child who doesn't speak at all at two and a half. Uh, but classic autism, I think, uh, of course, in the whole group of children who now meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder, classic autism is not the biggest group. It's uh, like 20, 30 percent uh, of the whole group. Uh, and, um, but this group can always and should always be recognisable by two and a half. So I'm Geraldine and uh, I've got a son, Angus, who's 16 now and he was diagnosed with ADHD when he was seven and then with uh, Asperger's syndrome when he was 13. If you've got classic autism by the age of two and a half and you meet criteria for autism once you do a full assessment, you virtually always have more than that. Right. You virtually always have, for instance, a combination of classic autism with a language disorder or intellectual disability or ADHD. Uh, or epilepsy or motor control problems. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, I mean, we've done studies recently to show that among two and a half year olds who meet criteria for autism and who come to a clinic uh, and are assessed at the clinic and they get the diagnosis of autism, 100% have another problem. 100%, um, my goodness. I think I first noticed that Angus was unusual when he started school. Um, he found it very, very difficult to settle at school. He was incredibly clingy. Um, to me and distressed being left and then when he was at school he f couldn't really settle down, sit down, focus, concentrate but I think the thing that we noticed more than anything else was his dyspraxia so he had real difficulty with coordination, um, manipulating objects, Lego, buttons, anything like that was 
pretty much impossible for him. And when it came to handwriting, he he really couldn't hold and use a pencil. And it was really that that took us um, down the route of being referred to a consultant paediatrician. I think with all the neurodevelopmental conditions like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, tics, I guess, to some extent, sensory issues, they're all hidden and they all cover a huge spectrum. And children tend not to just have one of these things, but they tend to have a whole combination or cocktail of different difficulties going on. So each child is unique and it's very difficult to know based on the labels that they have what that actually means in practice in terms of the needs that they're going to have and the special handling that they're going to need really to get the most out of life. Um, So I think that's very tough. And I think another aspect of this which is difficult is that a lot of this is hidden. So children may look on the face of it quite normal, if you like. They're quite outgoing, they're quite sociable, they they put on a good front, they become really, really good at masking these difficulties. And I think that often means that people don't see the impairment and then suddenly get a surprise when actually this child who ostensibly looks like they're a particular age can't do some of the very basic things that a child of that age should be able to do. And of course, for the child themselves, they also find that really embarrassing and difficult. And what's likely to happen to these children as they grow up? Well, that's also, uh, I mean, in in the past, I think people had the idea that if you had classic autism at that young age, uh, it, you know, life would be extremely difficult and you would never manage uh, an independent life when you're adult, Mm -hmm. for instance. But it does vary enormously. Uh, So that we now know that you can actually turn out to be somebody who can be very productive, uh, lead your own life as it were and and, uh, um, have a good job and uh, even in some cases have a family. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though in classic autism that is probably still quite rare, Um, it is, um, there is a small subgroup who will develop in that way Mm -hmm. Uh, and usually what marks that group is they develop a lot of language at least before the age of four or five. Uh, so even though they perhaps didn't say much before the age of two and a half, they suddenly start sure. speaking. Uh, and that's a marker for a very much better development. Uh, unless you do that, the likelihood that you're going to be dependent on other people for the rest of your life uh, is very, very high. So that kind of four or five year old age group is, is impo- another important... Another very important uh, age group to, to look at the kids again. Uh, And having said that, I mean, there are so many other things that enter into the equation. For instance, if you don't have ADHD with autism, uh, you're more likely to do better. Uh, If you don't have intellectual disability, you're much more likely to do better. Of course, that might not emerge until a bit later if you're not speaking. Exactly. So you will have to follow the children for several years in order to be able to come up with a good prognosis, if you will. Um, you can't make a good prognosis for anyone with autism at two and a half. Mm. Uh, it's not safe to say that treatment will immediately change their outcome. It's not safe to say it's going to be a bad outcome. And it's definitely not safe to say it's they're all going to be fine. Mm. Uh, but you can say a lot more about the likely outcome at about the age of five. Mm. Uh, and uh, again, that depends very much on the presence or not of much spoken language and the presence or not of intellectual disability. So Angus went through the first six years or so of having a diagnosis of just having an ADHD diagnosis and that made a lot of sense to us and the medication for ADHD was dramatically beneficial in our case although actually as he's moved into the teenage years he he doesn't like taking it anymore Um, and it's quite a big fight now but in the early years it made a huge difference so we were really relieved to have that ADHD diagnosis. When he became a teenager we began to wonder whether there were some other things going on as well um, because there were some aspects in the way in which uh, he communicated with us or didn't communicate with us or misinterpreted things that we said um, or couldn't understand what we were thinking that that were just a bit out of the ordinary. And when we discussed that with the CAMS team, they suggested that he should go forward for an autism assessment as well. And indeed, he he was 
diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder. But I think for him, ADHD is very much the primary issue. Um, having that autism label is perhaps helpful in understanding some of the ways in which he thinks or some of the ways in which he struggles to understand the world. But for me, ADHD is the thing that really affects him day to day because um, he just struggles so much with focus, concentration, short term memory, um, following through on, on anything that he, he starts. He's almost instantly lost track of what the goal was as soon as he started doing something. And that, that really makes a huge impact on his ability to function. Having a dual diagnosis, I think, for really is really difficult. Um, the, the autism is definitely affecting her social abilities and her ability to follow social cues. She just, she'll interrupt, she you know, speaks inappropriately, you know, when people are kind of looking at her like, why are you talking randomly in the middle of conversation? And they just don't understand her. Um, so I suppose that side of it is really challenging for her. But the ADHD, although she's very clever at school, it really affects her ability to be able to concentrate for long periods of time, to kind of settle down to her work quickly. Um, and she, she's very able, it's just that managing that sometimes can be really challenging. And some of the things that helps are, you know, the kind of sensory stimulation and being able to maybe take something along to focus on. But as you go through school and as you get older, that becomes less socially acceptable. And I think because she doesn't get the social cues, that impacts on her knowledge of why is this not okay. Um, and I think the judgment is really difficult for her because she is very clever and she understands that people are looking at her differently and basically kind of wondering what is going on. And when she doesn't have that answer, it's really hard. And she's quite open about talking about ADHD and the things that that makes her do and, you know, the way she can behave through that. But I think the older she gets, the less she's understanding how she can't control it. Um, you know, I think she's looking at herself and saying, I'm quite clever. Why can I not stop this feeling or this way that I am? So the, between the both, it's really difficult for her to be able to socially interact as well as the capacity just to wait your turn or, you know, just have your say, but have it fairly without trying to push it onto other people. So I think it must be almost like running in a ferris wheel you know just never getting off just going round and round and round and revisiting the same problems every day without really ever coming up with any solutions. There have been several studies showing that in the short term some of the interventions that are currently offered are very effective in changing uh, at least some of the symptoms of autism and uh, to an extent also the adaptive functioning of the children. They get better from the behavioural interventions that are currently available. Uh, but if you follow them up for more years, uh, the evidence is not as strong. And if you follow them up for 10 years, uh, it's actually quite difficult to say how much uh, intensive uh, behavioural interventions, for instance, actually do uh, work in terms of changing uh, the outcome for life uh, in a very positive way. We all hope that it does, but the evidence just isn't in. Mm -hmm. Maybe we just don't know yet. We just don't know yet. But um, it, it is also important to say, I think, that there is some good evidence uh, from all the studies that have been done across the globe that early discovery of the problems uh, early assessment and early um, sort of um, making it clear what the problems are mm -hmm. and also what the strengths are uh, to the family and to the people working on a day-to-day -day basis with the kids. That does make a difference that will last for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so early diagnosis, if you will, is probably even more important than the particular kind of intervention that you then mm -hmm. provide. So in a, in a way, diagnosis is the intervention. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And people very often tell you that, well, if we don't have an intervention, why diagnose? Uh, but actually, in this case, I, I'm a strong uh, believer in uh, diagnosis as such, that it actually does change uh, the outcome. Because, for instance, quality of life in a family who knows what they are dealing with in terms of the child's autism and all the other problems that are associated with it. I mean, that makes a huge difference. And there are very good studies showing that. Uh, and also, brothers and sisters do better. 
uh, because they too, I mean, have a better life if they know uh, why uh, my sister or brother is behaving in this mm. weird way, which people usually think is a weird way if you don't know what it is. It reminds me of, um, I remember almost tripping over a big kind of 10 year old girl having a massive temper tantrum in a GP surgery. Yeah. And I said to the mum kind of sympathetically, I feel, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, she's got autism. Yeah. And so, so I mean, that made sense to me. Yeah. We, we all kind of went, oh, she's got autism. Yeah. Just, yeah. There wasn't a kind of blaming. No, exactly. Um, but also, I mean, there are, uh, of course, things you need to know, uh, not just the diagnosis. I, I think a diagnosis is not just, you know, the word. <clears throat> it's always includes a full assessment of all the strengths and difficulties so that you really know, oh, this is how this child works and functions rather than... In these settings. In these settings. Yeah. And you can do these things in this setting, you can do other things in this other setting. Um, and then, of course, uh, for many of the so-called associated problems uh, that I mentioned, ADHD and, uh, you know, language disorder, etc., uh, there are actually very good interventions. Mm, uh, yeah, so it's important always, if a child gets the diagnosis of classic autism, uh, you would have to also diagnose and look for the other very often associated problems. Mm -hmm. And they can often be even better treated, if you will, than the autism per se. Yes, so you can help the person in the round. Yes. So is there anything else you'd want to say about classic autism, do you think, before we move on? Well, may maybe that, I mean, people still have this idea that this is what autism is. And perhaps, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's what autism used to be up until about 1990. Uh, everybody thought about it only as that group. Kind of locked in syndrome. Exactly. Uh, and so when people nowadays talk about autism, I think most uh, younger clinicians are aware that it is a much broader spectrum, if you will. Uh, and that there are many more uh, cases that are not as typically, uh, you know, disabled from a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think uh, it's important to know that even if you screen for autism at two and a half, you will pick up uh, virtually all of the classic autism cases, but you will only pick up a proportion of those who are not classic autism, but for instance, Asperger's syndrome. Well, I was just going to go on to ask you, how would you assess a child where there's suspected Asperger's syndrome, as we used to call it? Yeah. Well, I think Asperger's syndrome as a diagnosis uh, clinically will be around for a long, long time to come. Uh, it's the only thing that has happened with the event of the DSM-5 and uh, with the ICD-11 when it comes out <coughs> is that what used to be called Asperger's syndrome is now um, registered under the same code as autism. Um, mm -hmm. And there's absolutely no prohibition, as it were, against the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. And of course, there are millions of people around the globe who have been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And they will be allowed to use that diagnosis for the future. So in other words, Asperger's syndrome is seen as, still seen as a kind of subtype of, of Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's... Um, I mean, some people used uh, in the past to talk about high-functioning autism uh, and equated that with Asperger's syndrome. I think the word high-functioning autism is not a good one because it does suggest that you're not very autistic. You're high-functioning. Uh, and w what people really meant by that was that they were not intellectually disabled. So they were high-functioning in other ways, but their exactly. autism could still be very severe. Exactly. And actually, in my experience, many of the high-functioning, so-called high-functioning autism cases were extremely severe in terms of their autism mm. uh, and, you know, not severe in the other uh, fields. So they would not have intellectual disability and they would not have usually language disorder and less ADHD also, perhaps. And, and so what would somebody with, who, who's high-functioning in other ways but has severe autism, what would, what would they be like? Well, uh, I mean, usually what you would probably notice very early in life is that they would be loners, mm -hmm. uh, they would go off on their own, they would seem to be much less interested in age peers, uh, they would not mix with other kids uh, at around two, three, four. Um, they might look at other children, observe them, 
uh, standoffish and uh, you know outside the group and watch them uh, and but not get into the group or occasionally they would be inside the group as it were but they would be extremely passive and not really do anything in that group mm -hmm. or even more occasionally they might be somebody who would enter into the group and just dominate it mm -hmm. and you know decide you do this you do that mm -hmm. and have no respect as it were so for the other no sort of reciprocity no reciprocity but, yeah. that's actually very you know it's really the key to to high functioning cases if you mm -hmm. call them high functioning cases or asperger syndrome the lack of reciprocity in the here and now uh, having said that, I mean, when people with Asperger's syndrome grow up, many of them actually develop a good understanding of other people's points of view, of other people's minds. They can, as it were, read other people mm -hmm. uh, and they can understand what goes on in the minds of other people, which from the start people were saying nobody in the field of autism can ever understand the points of views and, and the other people's minds. Yes, because theory of mind, certainly when I was taught as a medical student, that was the kind of core. Exactly. And I think it's very core in uh, the young age groups. So, for instance, up until five, six, it's almost certainly the case that people who are diagnosed in the spectrum or with Asperger's syndrome would not be able to really think about other people's minds and that they have a different point of view or that they can be asked for help and that sort of thing. Uh, but gradually they sort of get it. Uh, they do understand that. They just get it late. They get it much, much later than other. I mean, in, in children who don't have Asperger's syndrome, this ability actually emerges uh, like very early in life. There, there are sort of uh, uh, indications of this long before age one. You, you can see how a, a very young child actually knows, well, I, I can look for those eyes and that person will probably be able to help me, etc. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's not happening in, in Asperger's syndrome. They don't come to you for help. They don't come to you for comfort. They don't come to show. Uh, what they've got, what they've done, what they're interested in. They might do it if you show interest uh, and if you're very sort of, please show me, please, uh, then they might do it, but they're not taking that initiative themselves. And when they're a bit older, as they start to understand that actually other people are different from myself, they, they have things that they can do to help me, etc. Uh, they can use that skill but the thing is, they will forever be much slower than other people and it doesn't come intuitively to mm. them. They have to think about mm. it. And does that make them a bit odd in some ways? Oh yeah. It will still, in the here and now, and particularly in a group setting, you will immediately feel that this is odd. This mm. person doesn't you know, participate. He or she is staring or probably listening and doesn't, you know, in a lively way interact with other people with his eyes or, or even with turning his head or with gesturing. Mm. Or if they do use gestures, it's very often a very sort of uh, very stereotyped way of using them. And do you think that's to do with them having to think about it? Yes, I do. We've done a study recently showing that if you if you force a person with Asperger's syndrome to really focus uh, on um, interacting with the other person, something very, very bad happens in his brain. Uh, uh, the, these so-called subcortical systems are overactivated. Uh, so you can understand that as soon as they have to interact like this, uh, and yet go on talking and you know thinking about what's going on as they look into the other people's eyes something whoa, goes on in there. Gosh, they're really stressed so by it. Stressed challenged. out mm. uh, and I think that is what happens throughout life if you have Asperger's mm. syndrome it's it's never gonna end that's mm. sort of so that social interaction if you're if you're intellectual I suppose you might get good at it yeah. but it's always going, going to be stressful and it's you, you're going to be stressed out at the end of the day for instance mm -hmm. if you're at work you will collapse when you get home after school day you may have appeared to be very well functioning and actually everybody says I don't see any of what you're talking about the the teacher might say that because he's so nice and we interact in such a good way and mother says when he comes home, he just goes into his room, closes the door uh, and cries or, or rocks or goes to sleep.
and you can tell he's completely stressed out. So I think the typical thing about somebody with Asperger's syndrome is it's not typical uh, other than in terms of the loneliness, uh, the standoffishness, uh, the weird reactions that other people think uh, this person has. For instance, not uh, wanting to join in, in group activities and that sort of thing. One of the things that um, I found interesting about reading about Asperger's and, and, and autism is this idea of central coherence yeah. and not seeing the wood for the trees. Can you say a little bit about that? Oh yes. I think even more typical than theory of mind problems, I think uh, the sort of uh, inability to fluctuate between uh, what we call central coherence um, and uh, not central coherence. Uh, that's to say between detail and the whole picture. Um, th that is very typical of all people in the autism spectrum. Uh, some of them are extremely good at detail and they can focus very well on detail. Others can actually focus on the whole picture. Um, that would be but, good central coherence. Yes, yes, but they can't go from one to the other. I think it's also really important to remember that ADHD and autism and all of these neurodiverse conditions bring strengths along with them. I mean, for sure, they do create massive challenges and I think they create big challenges for parents. But if it weren't for people with ASD, ADHD and so on, we wouldn't have some of our greatest comedians. We wouldn't have the Internet. We wouldn't have all sorts of things. And certainly when I look at my own son, he's got some extraordinary talents. He thinks of the most off the wall, hilariously funny things that I would never, ever think of. Um, he's an incredibly talented drummer. He's an amazing climber. Um, and when he was younger, he just had no fear, which, although at times my heart was in my mouth, at other times I was just like, oh, so proud because he was the little tiny kid at the very, very top of the massive climbing frame when all the other little children were still around the bottom looking up. Having Ailey's conditions is not all just doom and gloom. Sometimes she is the funniest person to be around and sometimes she can literally be that person that just raises your day, you know, when you're feeling down and when you're just gloomy. She's really good at being able to be that funny, inspirational person that you can always look on the bright side. Um, and she does it quite in a unique way that you wouldn't expect. And it, that's what kind of turns your head around. You know, it's not just somebody patting you on the shoulder saying it's going to be OK. She's really kind of gets deep into your soul, seems to know what's wrong and seems to know how to fix it. So that's fantastic. And um, she's got some really unique fantastic talents from a very young age she was able to do a lot of really good drama and she was fantastic at mimicking other like accents and voices and you know characteristics and um, so that was always made her stand out you know she went to any drama class although she had a lot of issues socially within them she was always the person that got the part because they knew that she would be able to do it you know far superior than anyone else in her age group um, and that made her feel quite proud of herself, which was great. Um, and she's fantastic at art as well. She loves to do art. Um, so these are really strengths that she draws upon. And she uses art a lot just as a kind of almost like a release, you know. So when things are getting too much, she'll sit and draw a character. She's really good at um, animation and things like that. So these are things that I would say beyond her years that, that she's more than capable of. Now, whether that's a link or not a link, I wouldn't want to say, but she's um, very capable of using these as strengths for her own abilities to, to drive forward. And it, it's really good to find that so that you can boost her self-esteem because it is a lot of negative stuff, you know, going on and a lot of, you know, you can't do, why are you doing? All those questions get asked a lot. So being able to say, do you know what, just simple things like that is fantastic what you've achieved today is it really raises you up as a mum as well as a child, so that's great. I think there's very good evidence that, um, you know, there, there have been a lot of um, famous people uh, who've had Asperger's syndrome uh, and a lot of people who are artists and mathematicians and scientists, mm -hmm. because if you, if you focus on detail uh, long enough and well enough, you'll discover things that other people would never have yeah. even seen. Uh, because most of us, we actually see the bigger picture at once. And once we do, we forget about the details. Mm -hmm. So we don't mm -hmm. see the little things. And, and a scientist who's got Asperger's syndrome would definitely probably 
what's that? Uh, that little thing there at the bottom of the picture, that doesn't seem right. And he will bore into it and, you know, really want to know what's that. Oh, interesting. I'm thinking of the, there was a story of a, a, a famous physicist whose mentor had said that the planetary orbits were circular. Yeah. And he noticed that there was, a, there was actually a, a calculation problem. Yeah. And changed our knowledge of Yes, it. absolutely. Of course, I can't remember his name. No, no, no neither can I. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, th th there are, um, e even people like Beethoven, there's just recently been a very good uh, um, PhD thesis written about Ludwig van Beethoven, uh, and uh, where the, the guy who wrote the thesis has taken uh, every which uh, sign of, uh, or symptom of autism that you could possibly think of uh, and demonstrated with very good um, historical evidence that Beethoven met all the criteria mm -hmm. and in such detail that it's, um, it's highly convincing that he must have had uh, at least what we call DSM-5 mm -hmm. autism. So thank goodness he did? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think also the whole uh, thing about the savant syndrome uh, is also very strongly linked to autism. Um, most people, I mean, if, if you look at so-called savant skills, which are, uh, you could also call splinter skills, or extremely good functioning in one area uh, where, where you don't function at any level uh, equally good uh, mm -hmm. in other areas. Um, that is much more typical of autism than of, you know, anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take normal people, as it were, whatever that is, but I mean people out there in the general population, uh, savant skills are extremely rare. But if you take a group of, uh, you know, a thousand people with a diagnosis of autism, it's more like 10, 15, 20 percent who have such savant skills. So it's, um, there's clearly some kind of uh, link here and I think it does link up with the central coherence mm -hmm. thing that they are able to focus on detail in a way which other people won't mm -hmm. be able to do because I think most people's brains are driven towards seeing the bigger picture more than the details. And also presumably very much taken up with social communication. Absolutely. And of course, if you don't have a very strong drive for social communication, uh, much time will be freed up to, yes. to do other things. And, you know, depending on how you look at it, it can be fine. And if we can only start accepting that some people are like this and others are not, many more are not, but the ones who are like this, maybe we should allow them more than we do to be who they are rather than try to force them to become social, uh, for instance. I think it's essential that they uh, are able themselves to function in a social world. Yes. But to demand that they should be equally social and to see progress as only being uh, you know, shown by if they progress socially, I think that's a mistake. Yes. The difficulties, I think, that for my child with um, having a dual diagnosis is Mostly, I think, the, the social interaction. She has very little friends and very little outlook to what that looks like. Um, the ability to make friends seems to be there. She can go up, she can talk to people, but sustaining that friendship is practically impossible. Um, there is, the, I suppose the deficit is, is the maintaining things, you know, like family outings are few and far between now because they're just too challenging. Um, Family members don't really understand her, certainly their community doesn't understand her. And although there is a big push on, you know, let's be diverse and accept it, actually whenever you've got a child that may be behaving erratically, sometimes violent, sometimes just not really knowing where her place is in the world, people don't understand that and they don't grasp it. And I think people look at it differently from when she was three and four to now that, you know, she's older and school is just not coping, community's not coping, family's not coping, and she's not coping. You know, she wants to be the same, she wants to fit in, but she's just struggling to do that. Um, school are really struggling because she is clever, and there is no kind of peace in the middle, which is, is really disheartening, actually, because if the, you have that support to kind of help her socially, that seems to be affecting that 
ability to succeed. Um, and she's frustrated by that because she knows that she's smarter than, you know, the, the work level and stuff. So I think she's feeling a wee bit in limbo. So I guess in limbo is exactly how it must feel. I think another thing for us observing um, a teenage boy with ADHD and ASD is um, now lots and lots of risky behaviours. So I think part of that is sensory because it's so, it's soothing to engage in things like cigarette smoking, drinking and so on. And I think part of it is a sort of adrenaline seeking behaviour as well that goes with ADHD. But that can be really, really difficult to manage. And for me, certainly, it means that I'm constantly on edge as to what might have happened now. I, I feel even now that my son is pretty much an adult, it's almost impossible for me to relax if I'm not supervising him or I don't know that another adult family member is supervising him because I, I just don't know what's going to happen next. Nobody is actually 100 on a scale. I mean, if you compare it to IQ and 100 is normal, uh, nobody is uh, 100 for attention, 100 for social, 100 for IQ, 100 for language. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there is no, nobody who's completely normal. Everybody is a little bit, you know, like this and like that. I think there are, for me, a couple of things that health professionals could really improve on um, or, or think about. One is that you're often put in this situation where you're having in front of your child to describe all sorts of problems and difficulties that they're having and behaviours that they've um, done. And that can be really, really embarrassing and shaming for that child in front of somebody that they barely know. And when you're trying to praise them and build their self-esteem, I think that's very demoralising. Um, and it certainly inhibits me from being able to talk freely. So I would always like to have the opportunity to speak to a health professional, not with my child, or, or for example, to email them or write to them or communicate with them in some other way so that I don't have to air all of that in front of my child. Um, I think the other thing that health professionals could do much better is to think about that developing child as they get older and trying to, early on, transfer the relationship from them to the parent to being directly with the child because as these kids go into the teenage years they have to start understanding about their own condition and developing their own strategies and coming to terms with it because they may well not buy into the labels that they've been given in the way that their mum or dad has gradually come to accept it and that then leads to a, a car crash really when they reach independence they don't accept these labels and they just head off and probably disengage from services completely or don't don't look for the help that could actually help them and that's certainly a big fear for me now because I see so many kids who've left school all that structure of school and structure of the parental environment has disappeared and those children really really struggle and flounder and I think health professionals could do a lot more to educate kids and begin to help them to develop their own relationship to their diagnosis and their own relationship to their condition before it gets to that point. Waiting on diagnosis was really challenging. It comes because sometimes you need all the factors to be in the one place before they'll move forward with that. We nearly went to a nursery when she was younger, she was only three. Um, the headmistress there really thought, oh, she's very clever and was not helpful and wouldn't put her forward and when reports were sent in she was saying that everything was fine really, there was no issue. So because it wasn't really materialising in more than one place, according to, to this um, head teacher, we couldn't really move forward and it was only when she moved into a different nursery after I had fought to have her a deferred year at school um, that they instantly said, no, we kind of agree here, there's definitely, you know, the social skills are not developing the way they should. This really should have been dealt with before. Um, and she was moved forward to CAMS at that point. So it meant she did have a diagnosis kind of quite young. Um, but the the process of waiting was quite excruciating because you're trying to take a lot of, you're asked a lot to take diaries and to, to write things down and try and remember what triggers are and... And to be fair, at that point, I really didn't know what the triggers were. So you spent a lot of time soul-searching for things that you weren't sure if they even existed. Um, and as a mum, 
I think it would have been better time spent just maybe giving her a hug instead of trying to justify or look for reasoning when maybe there just wasn't any. Um, so that was really hard. And trying to remember all that and go to meetings and discuss it um, was really difficult. And one of the things that really was just traumatic, I guess, is having sometimes to discuss all those negative behaviours when she's in the room along with health professionals. I still, to this day, struggle with that. And it's... Um, something that I'm not sure if it benefits anyone because when you're trying to reinforce positive behaviours but actually all you drag up is all that negative behaviour going through that process I'm not con I'm really not convinced that it's helpful one thing that I wish that health professionals would do better would be to be a wee bit more mindful of the families as they go through the diagnosis process and take time to maybe present as a buffer to some of that emotion that is going to come out at that first initial assessment. Um, I think that through the assessment process can be very direct and people want information and I understand that, but that family is really struggling and they are needing that support, they're needing that time um, to, to be able to express their emotions and things that have been built up over the years. Um, for that family, it might be the first time they've had you know, a health professional in this level with this kind of context and I think that that's something that really becomes apparent when you're having to talk about emotions especially about your child's emotions that you don't really understand um, so I think it's just allowing time give, have patience and be courteous always of that you know it's very easy to want the information that you need and want it quickly but that half hour might be the only time they've really spoken openly and honestly to anyone about this for a long time so being mindful of that and you know be courteous and try your best to overcome that kind of almost structure that you have to you know follow just try to be that person that can take on board what they're saying and maybe have some form of solution based policy there that could be able to say look these are seems to be the problems and maybe try and have that level of understanding of something that they could maybe go away with on that day rather than, right, we'll get back to you. You know, that can be harsh as well. So just solutions are always better than more problems. You've heard a lot about what people with autism find hard. That's because the condition is diagnosed on criteria that looks for deficits rather than strengths. It is true that for people with autism, living in a social world designed by social people can be very difficult, stressful, and sometimes impairing. Indeed, people with autism are more likely to suffer from mental health problems. However, autism also comes with a lot of strengths. People with autism can have an amazing eye for detail and spot patterns or small errors others might miss. We can be logical, rational, and systematic in our approach to our work. And if you give us clear instructions, we will probably follow them perfectly. We can be exceptional problem solvers and we can add a unique perspective to almost any team. Unlike neurotypical colleagues, we probably won't spend hours talking around the water cooler or engaging in social chit chat in work time. We probably won't take an extra few minutes in our lunch break, and we usually hate being late. If I'm getting on a plane, I want the guy who checks the plane before takeoff to have autism, because they're not going to be rushed by social pressure. They won't be distracted talking to their mates, and they won't say something looks good enough. It's either safe or it isn't. This is why a lot of companies are now specifically recruiting people with autism. It's also why, if I'm going into hospital, I want someone on my medical team to have autism. The positive qualities of autism don't just transfer to the workplace. People with autism can be exceptionally loyal. We will often take people at face value, maybe less likely to be affected by sexist, ageist or cultural biases, we can be very determined to seek the truth and be honest to our faults, regardless of whether others want to hear it or if it's socially or politically okay to say. We can also be exceptionally caring and even oversensitive to others' feelings when we're made aware of how other people are feeling. It's these qualities that make people with autism an invaluable part of society. The chances are that there will be someone with autism in your class and you'll certainly find colleagues with autism throughout your professional career. They're definitely worth getting to know. We might not always know the right thing to say or quite how to act, and we're not usually a big fan of parties. However, the chances are we'll know our stuff 
have something unique to bring to the team. And with a little effort, you can make yourself a very good friend and colleague.